So our next session, maternal health issues related to the fourth session for the day. It's been such a great day. The focus of this session is that critical period between birth and 12 weeks postpartum that's often neglected but can pose challenge uh, for mother, uh, mothers and, and infant. And really, it's more than just the 12 weeks. It's the whole 12 months, um, one year. Um, and it is my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, um, Dr. Allison Stuvey. She is a professor and distinguished scholar of infant and young child feeding in the Department of Maternal and Child Health at the Gilling School of Global Health. She holds the position of Division Director of Maternal Fetal Medicine at the School of Medicine at the University of North Carolina. Thank you so much. It's really an honor to be part of this amazing team of presenters today. And I have to say that Alison Bryant Mantha interviewed me for, it was my first residency interview way back many, many moons ago, and so it's kind of magical to get to be on a panel with her. Um, so I'm going to talk today about establishing the fourth trimester. Um, next slide. And I think, I, don't, um, I think one of the things that people have wondered is why is it that human newborns are so helpless at birth? Most other primate infants are, are considerably more developed, their brains are larger when they emerge from the womb, and so they don't require the same level of maternal care as human newborns. Um, and in looking at this issue, a team of anthropologists wrote this wonderful book called Costly and Cute, Helpless Infants and Human Evolution. Um, and they explore different theories for why it is that human newborns are the way they are. Um, and I think one of the most compelling ones is that there are advantages to having growth occur in the stimulating environment of the outside world and a dense social network. So what that means is because our newborns come out primed to learn and to engage, they're able to develop that much um, more individuality and social skills that are specific to the language and the interactions of the community around them. The other really important thing about human newborns is that they need other humans than just their mama to help care for them. And in fact, one of the reasons that anthropologists believe human newborns are so cute with the fat cheeks and the adorableness is because they need to enlist other grown-ups to help care for them. And I often share that with patients who are saying, gosh, <coughs> this is so hard. I can't do this all by myself. And I tell them, you're not supposed to. In fact, your baby is so adorable to get your village to come around and support you. However, while human evolution depends on that village, we have really stripped that village from modern life. And I was thrilled to see NBAC specifically call out the, the village thriving as part of their long-term goal. If a mama and a baby are alone, or even if it's a mama and a support person and a baby, that really isn't enough to help women and their babies recover during this time period and help birthing people to thrive. Um, so I wanna frame this discussion about the fourth trimester as really questioning what do we need as a culture, as a society to create an environment where infants and birthing people can thrive. Um, next slide. So this concept of the fourth trimester is not new. Um, the earliest reference I can find is from Sheila Kitzinger, who wrote about the fourth trimester in 1975. She was a home visit um, community nurse and midwife uh, in the UK in the 1960s and 70s. And she made the case that there is a fourth trimester to pregnancy and we neglect it at our peril. She wrote that it is a transitional period of approximately three months, particularly marked after first babies, when many women are emotionally highly vulnerable when they experience confusion and recurrent despair, and during which anxiety is normal and states of reactive depression are commonplace. So that was 46 years ago. Um, and I would argue that we still have a lot of work to do to really create an environment where birthing people and infants can thrive. Next slide. In addition to these experiences that um, Kitzinger described, we know that the fourth trimester is a critical time for survival. More than half of pregnancy-related maternal deaths occur after delivery. And we've spoken today at length about the unacceptable disparities in maternal mortality and morbidity. Um, and so if we wanna end those issues, we have to address care after the, the baby is born and the placenta is in the bucket and provide support for moms and families in this prolonged period of time. Next slide. When we think about what is currently offered in support of families, um, 
I have come to say that if the baby is the candy and the mother is the wrapper, once the candy is out of the wrapper, the wrapper is cast aside. Whereas we see birthing people weekly in the months leading up to birth, we see them, eh, we'll catch up with you at six weeks is the typical standard of care until recently in the United States. Um, although ACOG has made recommendations to have closer follow-up in that postpartum period, the insurance mechanisms currently pay for two visits for a C-section, one visit for a vaginal birth. And so it's very difficult to change a system of care when the framework and the insurance policies don't support providing that additional care. Next slide. In this audience, I don't need to tell you that this um, underappreciation and lack of care for the wrapper is even more pronounced for individuals that have been made vulnerable. Um, many folks have spoken beautifully and eloquently about reproductive justice today and stratified reproduction. In this essay, Lisa Harris and Tida Wolf write, Throughout the US history, the fertility and childbearing of poor women and women of color were not valued equally to those of affluent white women. And again, I think the audience here today completely knows this and folks who are far wiser and have far more lived experience than I do have spoken to this already. But when I'm sharing this with audiences who are new to this idea, I often point out that many of you may be familiar with the reality television show 19 and Counting, which is a television show about a white family with 19 children and planning more. And when I pause to think how that would have been received by the American public if it were a family of color with 19 children, I think it becomes really apparent the ways that we frame and value the reproduction of some and denigrate the reproduction of others. Next slide. This shows up in the ways that we think about contraception. Dorothy Roberts' book, Killing the Black Body, which I imagine everyone who's spoken today has read and could probably recite, makes the case that they say we don't need to spend money on social welfare programs or figure out racism and poverty. The solution is to keep these people from having children. And I think as we think about goals for improving care in the fourth trimester, we need to be really thoughtful about where we put contraception in that model. Because access to a full range of contraceptive options is absolutely necessary in order to enable birthing people to decide when they want to become pregnant again. But coercion, strong suggestion, or, or talking people into particular contraceptive methods becomes really troubling when we think about the history of um, eugenics and birth control in this country in the ways that it's been promoted and touted to particular populations. Next slide. I think it's also really important to appreciate the role of policies such as Medicare and the ways that racism has infused and affected outcomes to the present day. And I actually learned this first from Dr. Joya, that when Medicare was created in 1965, Part A was a federal program, which was funded by social security tax that ensured that everyone had access everyone over the age of 65 had access to a federally funded insurance program. Part B was a voluntary program for doctor's visits. And part C were matching funds for states to provide medical care for low income beneficiaries of aid to families as dependent children. You might wonder why a federal program for the elderly and a state program for low income families. And the answer was because of racism, that Southern white senators were not gonna vote for a program that mandated that they provide health care to communities of color. Next slide. As Heather McGee argues eloquently in her book, The Sum of Us, Johnson's Congress conceded to leave whether and how to offer Medicaid to the individual states in a compromise with racism that has curtailed the program's reach for decades. McGee's book, which is a fantastic critique and summary of the ways that social policies have been um, curtailed because of racism to, to the detriment of everyone, um, uses the example of the swimming pools that were present in many communities in the United States in the 1920s and 1930s. There were these beautiful public swimming pools that had slides and parks and all these amenities. Um, and then when court orders came down to integrate them, cities filled them with cement and plowed them under and said, we'd rather have no swimming pools than have swimming pools that were integrated. And so this kind of short-sightedness and this kind of structural racism and institutional racism harms everyone, most of all, those who are made vulnerable by our current policies. Next slide. When we think about Medicaid and the downstream effects of Medicaid being a state program, consider these data from the Kaiser Family Foundation at the proportion of um, uninsured individuals and in the states that have not received Medicaid expansion. And you'll see that in the Southeast, where the largest proportion of the population is folks of color, Medicaid expansion has not been implemented in most of those states. Next slide. And we think about what that means for the fourth trimester, consider that in North Carolina, 
a pregnant woman can receive Medicaid insurance if their income is at 201% of the poverty line. But a single mother of two can only receive Medicaid if she is at 41% of the federal poverty line. That's $9,000 per year or about $750 per month. So a single mother of two who earns $751 per month is too wealthy to receive health insurance in the state of North Carolina. And as you see here, Texas actually stands out as the most egregious with a cutoff of 17% of the FPL to qualify for Medicaid. Next slide. I think another place where we see systemic racism and stratified reproduction showing up is in policies around parental leave. This was a study conducted in 2012, looking at the duration of leave taken by men and women following the birth of a baby. And what you see here is that 23% of employed women are back at work within 10 days postpartum. 10 days postpartum, folks are still wearing the mesh panties and like the giant pad. Folks are still leaking from all sorts of places. Um, mothers are still figuring out how to breastfeed. Babies are still figuring out who their mama is. And yet 23% of women are back at work. And when we think about who, <coughs> excuse me, who the women are who do not have access to paid leave, they are those in the lowest income brackets. They are those with the least accumulated wealth. And that might be the consequence of a policy such as redlining that prevented their grandparents from being able to buy a home in the 1930s, which prevented that income from being passed down across generations so that the woman today is unable to take unpaid leave. So when we think about the kinds of policies we need to consider to truly achieve health equity, we need universal paid parental leave so that one's income and one's life history doesn't determine whether or not one is able to bond with one's child. Next slide. The consequences of the short-sighted and frankly racist policies of paid leave in this country are summarized in this excellent essay where the authors write, the lack of policy substantially benefiting early life in the United States constitute a grave social injustice. Those who are already most disadvantaged in our society bear the greatest burden. Next slide. We've already heard from a couple of these outstanding women today. Um, and I include this quote whenever I talk about the fourth trimester, whenever I talk about health equity. There is no answer to solving this crisis that Black women do not already know. It is in their lived experiences and resilience that drives innovation and belonging. And we as stakeholders should take heed. I want to congratulate the panel for really being intentional about including a broad array of folks with lived experience, uh, birth workers and, and folks who have birthed in the system that we have today to really challenge us to think beyond the current paradigm and transform our culture so that we can deliver equitable care for all. Next slide. When I think about what we might do better, my North Star in many ways is this brilliant statement by Chanel Portia Albert, who I believe is presenting tomorrow. At Decolonized Birth 2019, she said, every woman should be able to say, every birthing person should be able to say, I am seen, I am heard, I am loved. And I think if we set that as our goal for the experience of maternity care, of birth care, and of care in the fourth trimester, we would go a long way toward achieving equitable outcomes. Next slide. Others have also spoken beautifully today about the importance of shared decision-making. Um, and I think it's really important to appreciate that shared decision-making brings at least two experts to the table, the patient and the provider. Providers are experts in the clinical evidence and the patient and her family are experts in their experiences and values. So when we consider the historical kind of paternalistic model, the doctor told the patient what to do and the patient said, yes, ma'am, or yes, sir. Um, then folks said, well, I don't want to make decisions for people, so we'll give information. We'll say, your blood pressure is 170 over 120. Would you like labetalol or nifedipine? And that doesn't make a whole lot of sense because simply providing information when the patient doesn't have a context doesn't really enable them to make a shared decision. Rather, the goal is to elicit values and preferences from the patient and then share information and recommendations and together reach a shared decision. And one of the things I often say when I'm teaching medical students and residents is that shared decision-making does not mean that the patient shares the physician's opinion at the end of the conversation about what should happen next, but rather that the patient is able to make a decision with complete information. Next slide. It was also pointed out to me that the model of the physician, I'm sorry, go back one, that was an animation, um, that the model of the single physician and the single patient is not necessarily realistic, but rather there is a healthcare team. And then the patient and her family and loved ones that together need to share those values and preferences and make shared decisions. Next slide. 
I also think that it's critically important to provide families with comprehensive information. Um, NewMomHealth.com and Salud Madre are projects of the fourth trimester project here at UNC. And we have some core values that we attempted to embody in this online resource. We believe that health information should be honest, accurate, clear, high quality, and based on the most current science. We also believe that women are resilient, strong, and capable of making quality decisions for themselves and their families. And finally, we believe that communities and health systems should care for the mother rather than demanding that she access care. So I urge you to check out the site. Please send us feedback if there are things that you think we could do better. We're always looking to improve. Um, and also notice that we really made an effort not to say you should do this, but to say some women find this helpful and others find this helpful. Figure out what makes sense for you because we really wanted to respect this idea that women are experts in their own bodies. They've lived in their bodies their whole lives. And we as their providers, and certainly we as the people writing on a website, can't possibly know better than they do what makes the most sense for them. Next slide. I also think we need to aim higher, as, as many today have pointed out, than just survival, and really think about what it means for women to thrive. Um, Jennifer Fahi is a midwife um, who worked on this perinatal model of health. And she notes that at the center is maternal health and that's surrounded by physical recovery and care for self infant and family and maternal role attainment. But then what folks really need are some core skills. They need to be able to effectively um, mobilize social support. They need self efficacy. They need positive coping skills and they need realistic expectations. We need to design care that builds those skills and supports those capacities. And then we need to make sure there are the external resources to make that actually possible. Next slide. Others today have outlined reproductive justice, again, more eloquently than I ever could. Um, but we need to ensure that every individual has a human right to maintain personal bodily autonomy, to have children, to not have children, and to parent the children we have in safe and sustainable communities. Indeed, how might we build a society that protects and values every parent and every child? Next slide. To close with a quote from Dr. Joya who opened this morning, what would it look like for mothers to not only survive pregnancy, but to thrive? Thank you.